Um, okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the first session of our uh, spatial ML uh, seminar series. Um, so this is going to be a monthly series uh, on the third Tuesday of every month um, at, at the same time. Um, and this is going to be just a series of talks from students and faculty members from the Spatial ML Center, as well as hopefully external speakers um, around the topics of spatial computations, machine learning, and, and reconfigurable architectures and FPGAs. Um, so a little bit of information about Spatial ML for people who are not part of the center. Uh, so. Um, spatial ML is the International Center for Spatial Computational Learning, um, and this is basically just a it's a, it's a center to center award that is uh, uh, given by the Engineering and Physical Sciences uh, Research Council, the EPSRC uh, in the UK. Um, and the intention of this award is basically to form a research center that combines uh, different institutes and universities, uh, not just in the UK, but offshores as well. Um, so the, the center right now brings together um, students and faculty members from um, a bunch of universities, in Imperial College London, uh, University of Southampton, uh, King's College, University of Toronto, UCLA, uh, University of Sydney, and uh, Cornell um, in the US. Um, so yeah, so hopefully um, you are interested in this seminar series and uh, we get to see you again uh, next time. Uh, so today we have a, a very interesting talk, uh, um, uh, Athena uh, by Benjamin Biggs. Um, so Ben is a PhD candidate in the Circuits and Systems Group at Imperial College London, supervised by uh, Professor George Constantinidis and uh, Professor Christos savas Boganis. Uh, his research interests include the uh, digital hardware, uh, probabilistic modeling, uh, deep learning, dynamic neural networks, which he'll talk about today, um, and also FPGA-based uh, accelerator design. So uh, yeah, please welcome, join me to welcome Ben, and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Andrew. Uh... So hello everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, our paper Athena, a tool flow for hardware early exit network automation. Uh, so a little bit about the motivation. So accelerating uh, deep neural network inference is, is a very well, well researched topic. Uh, many of you attending now will be aware of kind of both handcrafted and, and tool generated instances of these kind of FPGA based accelerators. Um, in particular, we have lots of examples of mapping sort of standard convolutional neural networks onto FPGAs. Uh, many tools out there that can generate these kind of optimal mappings uh, for existing CNNs. Uh, examples of these include things like HPipe, uh, FPGA ConvNet, and many, many more. Um, so these existing tools make use of a lot of the FPGA specific advantages. Uh, coupled with advancements in things like parameter efficiency um, for neural networks uh, to improve uh, accelerator performance. Uh, for example, you have like custom architectures for zero skipping for things like unstructured pruning um, or efficient operations uh, using like non-standard number representations for like heavily quantized networks. Uh, but this only gets you so far. Uh, the effects of a lot of these static methods on computation are felt equally or uniformly across the different data samples. Uh, however, we know that data is not uniform in the computation or features required. Uh, let's kind of take a, take a very obvious example here. We've got uh, an easy classification and a hard classification. You, kind of, you don't have to spend much computation at all working out that the top image is definitely an owl. Uh, the bottom one is a little bit trickier, um, but it's just there. Uh, so if you're locked into like a fixed network structure, you won't necessarily be able to benefit from this kind of significant significant difference in uh, like computation required. Uh, so there's this growing body of work using input dependence to improve inference performance. So this includes both software and hardware methods, uh, things like Cascade CNN and SkipNet. 
uh, but we're going to focus on a category of neural network architectures called early exit networks. Uh, essentially, you're able to terminate a computation within a CNN at some earlier stage in that CNN. And on average, inference is faster. So we can use this early stopping mechanism to design kind of these more performant accelerators. So to be clear, this method is being treated orthogonal to static methods. So both the baseline and uh, the baseline we compare against and our Athena designs benefit from quantization. Um, and we've seen works that incorporate both heavy quantization and pruning coupled with early exit networks as well. Uh, and our problem focus, we're narrowing it down uh, to high throughput accelerators that have latency constraints that prohibit, prohibit things like reconfiguration. So we're sort of focusing on designs that all fit on one chip. So I'll go into the anatomy of early exit networks a little bit. So one of the first instances of these in the literature is something called branchy net, and it has kind of this overall structure. Um, the typical structure consists of this backbone network, which is equivalent to like a standard CNN in most cases, with all your favorite layers like convolution, pooling, activation, etc. Um, at certain points on this backbone, you have this kind of forking or branching structure uh, with additional feature extraction and the classification uh, at your early exit stage. So most importantly, for the dynamic nature of these networks, you have this, uh, what we call like a confidence metric. Um, this is used to determine whether or not we exit at a particular stage. Uh, so in the wild, we've seen things like information entropy over the output of the softmax layer, um, as well as the kind of maximum value of a softmax output um, being over a certain threshold. So now for the uh, Athena methodology and our research contributions. The main one is that this is the only tool flow that uh, to support the automated acceleration of early exit networks. Uh, since since uh, doing this talk at FCCM, I've kind of found a few, found a paper that is also uh, supporting early exit network acceleration, but only for a very kind of specific uh, neural network uh, specific uh, heavily quantized neural network so not quite as general as, as our tool flow uh, but there's kind of lots of, of uh, interesting research uh, coming out more recently in this direction so we build and extend the open source fpj confnet tool uh, which maps cnns to a custom streaming architecture to support ee networks uh, and we have these e specific hardware templates which we've added into fpj confnet uh, as part of athena um, we do a special resource allocation specific to early exit networks, and then we do early exit profiling. So first, uh, the first kind of change we had to make, uh, a lot of the existing uh, layers inside FPJ Confnet, there's no concept of uh, distinct samples in kind of a continuous stream of incoming data. So we have to uh, augment the existing layers with this sample ID so that if uh, a later sample overtakes an earlier sample, you're able to kind of match up the classification result with the, with the initial image. We added some uh, new templated hardware layers to the standard CNN. Uh, so this includes a split layer, which performs this kind of fork operation for data passing through it. Uh, here we've represented that as these kind of branching arrows. Um, and the exit selection or merge layer, which takes the classification results from early and late exits and coherently merges the output streams before streaming those off chip. So I'm going to leave this off the diagram because it just kind of adds a additional complexity, but know that it is there kind of making sure that the streams make their way off chip. Then we've got the exit decision layer responsible for determining if the network is confident enough about a particular result to exit or not. And uh, arguably most importantly, the conditional buffer layer, uh, which stores the intermediate feature maps and into early classification results. It lets data pass through depending on the control signal received from the early exit decision layer. Uh, so when it gets this decision um, to early exit, we drop any kind of intermediate feature map data uh, so that it is prevented from making it to later stages of the network. 
And in this, in this way, we save on uh, computation for that later stage of the network. There's kind of more detailed diagrams for these layers in the paper. Um, yeah. So now we're going to look at resource allocation. Uh, for this explanation, we're using a, a two-stage early exit network, uh, but the same kind of methodology can be applied more broadly to uh, more exits. We use the conditional buffer placement as a sort of dividing line between the two stages of the network here. Uh, we determine the potential accelerated design points for this first stage by generating a paratope front using a CNN to FPGA mapping tool. Uh, in our case, we have our extended version of the open source FPJ ComNet, and the points along this curve generated are, are the best achievable throughputs for a given area constraint. We repeat this process for the second stage of the network, and now this is the, this is the key part. Only a certain percentage of the samples will go through to that second stage. Uh, for example, let's say 75% are exiting early and 25% are reaching that later stage and exiting at the final exit. Using a profiling data set, we are able to estimate the probability of hard samples, so samples that exit at the final exit, during the design phase. Knowing the probability at design time means that we can scale the throughput target of the second stage according to the probability. So the effective throughput of the second stage, in this case, is scaled by four. Great, so now we have a range of designs for our first and second stage. We need to combine them for a full design. Ideally, we would have both stages with a matching throughput. Um, this gives us a stage one and a stage two design. Then we take the area for both of these designs and sum them together. Now, obviously, this isn't a perfect representation because we're modeling the interaction between the stages, and that will have an effect on resources at synthesis. And we're using, uh, in part, HLS, which also has plenty of variation in area as well. But this will leave us with our final design point there. Uh, since the Parato curves of both stages consist of discrete design points, uh, resulting from kind of design time optimization, design time optimizations that are discrete, we may end up with stages that don't have a matching throughput uh, like these two. So in this case, we would compare the throughputs, uh, something like this, and then we have to choose the minimum uh, to represent that design point because the final design will be limited by the lowest overall throughput. Uh, so we repeat this process in an automated fashion as part of the tool flow, and this leaves you with a new throughput area uh, Parato curve for the combined stages at the design time probability. But what if this probability changes? Uh, so we model this as a sort of fuzzy area surrounding the main design curve. Uh, the borders of this area represent a deviation in probability of some delta from the design time probability, P. And we call this runtime probability, Q. Uh, in the general case, if we underpredict the value of P so that Q is greater than P, uh, then you would end up with a throughput below the central curve, as you'll be limited by the second stage throughput. And if you overpredict over the value of P, uh, so that Q is lower than P, then you may end up with a higher throughput. Um, so this is due to uh, this. Yeah, this is again due to th throughputs of the different stages not matching perfectly. Um, and we've got some uh, more detail on the effects of this in the paper and how we potentially mitigate against that. So how do we get those probabilities in the first place? Well, first, we move back to the, the sort of software realm. We're back in, in PyTorch land or ONNX land. Um, and as part of the early exit CNN passing process, we require a subset of test data to be provided to us. Um, using the provided software model of the network, we attach various trackers, um, that's those in, in place of those owls, um, which is a little bit of an abstract representation, but I think you understand what I mean. Um, and these trackers, uh, we feed data through the model, and various trackers determine a number of things, 
like accuracy at a, a given exit, loss at a given exit, and most importantly, the exit percentage at a given exit. Uh, okay, so that's kind of done with the methodology. Now we're gonna look at some of the results, starting off with this graph. Uh, so we have throughput on the y-axis and a representation of area on the x-axis. So we implement a baseline version of the network with no early exits using uh, vanilla FPGA ConvNet. Um, as you'd expect, the more resources you allocate to FPGA ConvNet, the more uh, throughput you can achieve. So given a P value of 25%, meaning samples only have a one in four chance of getting to the second stage, the Athena Toolflow designs an accelerator that can achieve significant throughput improvements compared to that baseline. So comparing against the best possible throughput from the baseline, we more than double the gain at a lower resource usage. Uh, and framing this another way, against that same baseline point, we are able to match the throughput with about half of the resources used. So we mentioned uh, a bit earlier that there's this kind of fuzzy area uh, surrounding the design time curve when the design time probability doesn't necessarily match up with runtime probability. There's you know, deviation in, in real world data from the kind of expected distribution. Um, and that's this kind of fuzzy area here. So we ran some experiments on the probability deviations of plus and minus five percentage points. Um, and yeah, so I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. So in many cases, uh, the resulting points are, are bounded tightly to the design time curve, as you can see here. Um, but even in the instances where there is kind of a noticeable degradation in throughput compared to design time, uh, it still performs uh, better than the baseline. So as I said before, this uh, particular case was designed for a 25% value of P, uh, but the trend of kind of being above the baseline continues to hold uh, for, as high at, for P as high as 50% for this particular network and task. Um, and in the paper, we detail throughput improvements on uh, some other networks and data sets. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, there's, there's a link to the paper, but I'm sure we can uh, send around an archive link at some point if we need to. Um, yeah, that's kind of leave you with the summary there. Um, are there any questions? <laughs>